Welcome to the continuation of our series of videos on loads on buildings. We're in section 2, subsection 5, sub subsection 1.1 up through point 3. We're, so we're dealing with static wind loads in chapter 2. Uh, here's a plan view of a building with a somewhat unusual shape and that was chosen to illustrate a certain point that when wind comes from this direction this is a very streamlined aerodynamic shape that produces laminar flow and if it's coming straight on to the edge here uh, that laminar flow is going to have very little uh, effect on the building uh, this laminar flow might come at a slight angle in which case this might become sort of like the uh, the foil of a wing of a plane, in which case the lateral forces on it could become quite severe. Um, wind from the perpendicular direction encounters this building and in that direction the building is very unaerodynamic um, and it creates huge vortices as the air tries to slip around the building and becomes confused in its flow on the backside. Um, we have similar kinds of turbulent effects. This is a sectional view of a building. So this would be the ground, this is the building, and because the building is so abrupt, uh, it creates more uh, turbulence and more of these vortices. And one of the characteristics of vortices is that when, when a vortex forms and then moves away from the building, there'll be a moment of laminar flow and then more turbulence will develop. So these are oscillatory kinds of loads that can produce some very disturbing effects in buildings if the uh, turbulence is of such a nature that it, the natural frequency of vortex shedding is similar to one of the natural frequencies of the building structure. This is a plan view of a building which is roughly square and plan. Um, there's a line along here suggesting that this is a gabled roof. Um, we're having wind coming from the left here um, and continuing on past. And what we discover is when we take the data that the, the, the wind effect on this wall that's facing towards um, the wind direction has an overpressure. As the wind goes around the building, there's a Venturi effect or Bernoulli effect, and uh, basically we end up with suction on that wall. And then we also end up with suction on this back wall. And um, in this particular diagram, we're not indicating the actual magnitude of that suction because it will depend on the wind speed, and the di design wind speed varies from one place to another. But we do have something here, these are um, coefficients that have to do with form issues. And this coefficient is plus 0.8, the plus meaning overpressure, and the 0 0.8 being some kind of an indicator of its magnitude. And that's a kind of a relative indicator. So when we go to these sidewalls, we get suction. So this uh, coefficient is negative and its magnitude is 0 0.7. So this wind suction on the sidewalls is close to comparable to this overpressure. It's the difference between eight and seven. Um, on the, this would be the windward side. On the leeward side, we get suction that varies between minus 0 0.3 and minus 0 0.5. So in magnitude, this is smaller than that which is smaller than that. This uh, is variable because of this turbulence effect. Uh, from one second to the next, there can be large variations in what that suction pressure is. So this is a side view or a sectional view of that building. Here we have CP equals plus 0 0.8 on the windward wall. Our suction on the leeward wall again varies between minus 0 0.3 and minus 0 0.5. Uh, we're dealing with the case of a shallow roof. Uh, 
And interestingly enough, we got a fairly smooth laminar flow over the entire roof. And we actually not only get suction on this side, but we get suction on that side. That may be uh, counterintuitive to you, um, because what that suggests is that relative to this surface, there's no force in the horizontal direction. Relative to this surface, there's a force that way and a force that way, and their horizontal components are canceling each other to produce a single vertical force. And I had the opportunity a few years back to actually observe this principle in action um, by the sheer ac accident of having been in the right place at the right time. I had an umbrella on my back porch which had a shape roughly like this. In plan it was octagonal, but it was one of these canvas umbrellas with straight uh, wood spars that held it out. And the umbrella shaft went down into a tube which kept the umbrella upright. So the wind was blowing and it was a fairly steady wind and as I was washing dishes and staring out my window I noticed that the umbrella started to lift up. Now if there had been a significant horizontal force I don't think it would have done that because the, the shaft of the umbrella was a pretty rough piece of wood and it was down inside of a piece of steel tube that hadn't been polished or, or ground carefully. But it seemed to lift up almost effortlessly and the wind subsided slightly and it would start to lower down and then the wind would pick up a little bit and it would start to lift up. And it went through quite a few cycles like that where, because the wind was so steady but it was varying slightly. And during that entire time the umbrella never set back down on the base totally. It just drifted up and down. And then the wind picked up slightly and the umbrella shaft lifted up completely out of the tube that was stabilizing it. And of course my thought was as soon as that happens the umbrella is going to keel over to the side. But amazingly the umbrella just hovered there for several seconds. So there's a horizontal wind and yet the umbrella is not moving in the horizontal direction. It's moving mainly up and down. And eventually it began to tilt over slightly and then very, very gradually began to develop a horizontal component. But because it hovered in that configuration for so long, it was the perfect demonstration of this idea that there is a perpendicular force on this face and a perpendicular force on that face and the horizontal components of those two things are canceling out and the net effect is an upward lift on the roof. If we go to a much steeper roof eventually we can reach the point where we have overpressure. In other words if this roof gets steep enough it begins to act sort of like a wall uh, in that it's frontal to the wind. Um, the behavior under those circumstances can be variable and there are certain slopes where we can literally have some suction every once in a while and overpressure and those two things can occur in very close proximity to each other in terms of time. Um, so in other words the pressure in that zone is um, highly variable and is a very dynamic kind of thing. Again though, the wind suction on this face doesn't change, nor does the wind suction on the leeward side, but this becomes much more confused in terms of its behavior. We can do uh, <coughs> wind maps like this. These wind maps, by the way, give you uh, sort of an indicator of behavior, but they cannot be used as a basis for design. And the reason is that every municipality or every jurisdiction in the country has the right to set its wind load wherever it believes is appropriate. And so you have to consult the local code anywhere that you're designing. Um, and that's particularly true of wind and of course it's true of seismic effects also. These numbers here by the way, 150 means that the design wind speed is 150 miles an hour. Uh, 
This is down at the very southern tip of Florida. If we look up at North Carolina, we see that our coast is mostly designed to 130, although there are parts here that it becomes closer to 140. Again, though, even within the state of North Carolina, you have to go look up what the wind speed is at any given location. The key point is that all around in here, there's a huge zone that's about 90, 90 miles an hour, and the real high wind loads are occurring near the coast and in particular the southern coast is particularly brutal both here around Louisiana and the tip of Florida. Now in accounting for um, issues of this sort um, we have building categories and they have importance factors so these are like additional uh, margins of safety except that they go in addition to the usual load factors of 1.2 for the dead load and 1.6 for the live load and 1.6 for the wind load. In addition to the 1.6 that we normally apply for the wind load, we also apply this importance factor as a load factor. Um, really unimportant structures, we might actually reduce it down. So an example of this might be a tobacco barn on a farm where if it blows over chances are it's not going to have a huge adverse effect on anyone around it and chances are nobody's going to be in that tobacco barn when the hurricane comes. That might not be true of tornadoes but we don't design for tornadoes. Um, there's been a lot of talk in recent years that maybe we should but we typically don't because the cost of uh, dealing with the two or three hundred mile an hour winds in tornadoes given the frequency of them if you actually are sort of cold-blooded and statistical in your analysis you conclude that the cost of, of uh, strengthening every structure to withstand a 300 mile an hour wind is simply not economically logical but people continue to talk about it and there's a fair chance that at some point in the future we will be designing our structures to resist those wind forces. Okay, so there's a category two, which is sort of ordinary buildings, and then categories three and four are buildings of special importance, like buildings where large numbers of people could die in one, one event, or they could also be a buildings of vital importance, like hospitals and police stations. So we throw in an extra margin of safety for those. So, we can talk about levels of wind load analysis. Clearly, you're not going to worry about your wind load as much on a tobacco barn as you are on a 2,000 foot tall high-rise building. So we have, we have different degrees of thoroughness. All right, method one is limited to enclosed rigid buildings that are less than 60 feet tall, and it's a very simplified method. And that, by the way, is the only method that we're going to spend any time on in a quantitative way in this course. Uh, method two is more detailed and more generally applicable, um, but it's basically a kind of hand calculation uh, that's more detailed than method one. Um, and then in method three, which is your highest level of analysis, you can actually do wind tunnel testing or computer simulations and typically uh, in the modern world anybody who goes to the trouble to do wind tunnel testing also does computer simulation. This is particularly true of any significant high-rise building. And in, in particular one of the crucial issues that has to be accounted for in wind tunnel testing and computer simulations is vibration or oscillations which can come from vortex shedding on high-rise buildings, for example. Neither of these methods account for those dynamic effects. Methods one and two are both static methods. They're simply different levels of detail. Okay, so here's one of the ways that we deal with it. This is method one, which as I mentioned is the simplest method. It's for buildings less than 60 feet tall. They have to be enclosed and they have to be rigid and we, we can't get into too much detail in a course of this nature on what rigid means but clearly a very tall um, high-rise building that's very slender uh, 
can get all kinds of whippy action in it. On the other hand, a structure that has good diaphragm roof and shear walls and has this kind of configuration is going to be inherently so stiff uh, that we're not going to worry about uh, oscillations in a structure of this sort. So we're going to stick with static analysis and by the way you'll notice at the top it always tells us something about what we're dealing with and in this case we're dealing with the main wind forced resisting system. In other words we're not focusing on envelope or or cladding, we're focusing on the, the major structural elements that are resisting these wind forces. Okay, so there's a diagram here that kind of expresses how we're accounting for things. Um, on, the, on this vertical wall, we have overpressure due to wind going that way. So, and we have four different zones, excuse me, two zones. So these blocks right here, A and C, represent what's happening on that wall. Now, there are rules about how wide A is and how wide C is, but we're not going to bother with those for reasons that become clear in a few moments. Um, the cost implications of analyzing for, for this more complex distribution versus say taking just A as our number, those cost implications are fairly minimal. So what we're going to do for our purposes is we're going to say relative to this windward load, we're going to take whatever pressures are designated for zone A and we're just going to ignore, we're going to apply those same forces to zone C. Now when we come to this portion of the roof, You'll notice we've got a vertical force and there's a zone F here where those forces are more intense and then a zone H where they're less intense. We're going to just go with zone F. On this sloped portion of the roof, there's a horizontal component and a vertical component. And for the vertical co component, we're going to take whatever values are given for zone E for the horizontal component, we're going to give whatever, take whatever values are given for zone B, and we will apply those zone B values across the entire roof. Now, this is a, a deeply frustrating thing to me because back here, we were talking about this whole notion of having both horizontal and vertical components on that face and both horizontal and vertical components on this face. Someone, in their wisdom, which I regard as somewhat questionable, decided that relative to the analysis of this surface, they were only going to take the vertical component, and then they're going to take the horizontal component and combine it over here. So whatever horizontal component occurs over here has incorporated in it the normal horizontal component associated with this surface plus the horizontal component associated with that surface. Now. It's extremely questionable whether that even really simplifies things that much. It does some. Um, but what it does is it loses all the physics. So when you sit and look at the numbers for this surface, they appear to produce a force that's not perpendicular to the surface, and which it should be. The physics says it should be essentially perpendicular to that surface. And on this surface, we don't have a horizontal component, so it's not perpendicular to the surface either. So the physics is obscured. Now, this analysis technique is pretty accurate when it comes to the main wind force resisting system. It doesn't change the results much to take the horizontal component in this zone and combine it with a horizontal component in that zone. It just leaves you with this frustrated feeling that the numbers you're looking at don't reflect the physics and the physics makes pretty good sense so it would be nice in terms of our understanding <laughs> if those two things were similar okay so in raleigh north carolina the wind the design wind speed is 95 miles an hour uh, to get that we'd have to interpolate between 90 and 100 and for the purposes of this course we're being a little lazy we're not going to do interpolation we're going to take a 100 mile an hour wind, wind speed, 
and we can always be conservative by the way there's there's no rule whatsoever that says you can't design something on the conservative side so 100 versus 95 is not a really big issue it will increase the forces somewhat that we're designing to and make the building stronger but it won't drastically increase the cost okay so horizontal pressures let's go back and look we said on this wall we're going to take pressure a so when we come here we see column a horizontal pressure if we're dealing with a flat roof it's 15.9 pounds per square foot of over pressure as soon as we start sloping the roof though the the pressure on the windward wall begins to increase and if we have a 20 percent slope it's 22 pounds per square foot and ironically when we go above that it begins to then trail off slightly we're going to keep things simple for the purposes of what we're doing in this class we just want to know order of magnitudes of things so we're going to take flat roof buildings and typically stick with this 15.9 but you should understand it does get substantially larger when you talk about steeper roof slopes so um, we're now going to go back and we're going to say we're ignoring C but for your interest C looks like this C is always smaller than A so if we put pressure A everywhere on the windward wall, wall we're on the conservative side and by the way this is typically the way engineers do things they they make a bunch of conservative assumptions like we're going to ignore C and only use A and um, and then we're going to use 100 mile an hour wind instead of 95 and if somewhere along the way they look at their analysis and they say boy we just are slightly short of being able to meet this with some really economical structural solution then they might go back and run these numbers again using C and A and so forth so again you look at the situation and ask yourself how much does it cost us to be a little less conservative and do a more detailed analysis which is still meets code and is still safe we just have to do more work in order to get that solution out engineers by the way just like architects work incredibly hard for the money they make and so um, typically we don't make this analysis any more complicated than we need to assure that we get an economical solution okay so I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at this uh, sloped portion of the roof back here we said we were going to go with F so when we come along we have F like so and for the flat roof we've got uh, a suction upward of 10.8 pounds per square foot now we're going to go back and we say zone E is right here um, we said we're going to ignore G we're going to use E everywhere across the slope so E turns out now to be our biggest force it's a suction up on the roof on the windward half of the roof of 19.1 pounds per square foot and then we're going to do the horizontal component on the sloped portion of the roof which is B we said we're going to use B everywhere across this sloped roof and so when we go look at that we see it's minus 8.2 of course actually that's negligible because we're essentially going to deal with a, a flat roof in this case so um, if, if we were going to account for a five degree slope then we'd have some vertical face into the wind and then we'd have to use this force but because we said we're going to focus on uh, flat roofs this is zero so we have to account for this and that and that um, and the other interesting thing by the way is I failed to mention this before you'll notice we're showing no force on the leeward side because whatever was occurring on the leeward side has been combined and put over on the windward side so this is another example where
the building physics or the, the physics of the wind interacting with the building is not properly expressed because in every case, horizontal components on that surface have been combined with the horizontal component on this surface. Horizontal components on the leeward wall have been added to the horizontal component on the windward wall. And the net effect is that we've simplified the analysis, but when we come down here, we don't have any wind suction on the leeward side. Okay, so we're going to go down in this table. This is the lower half of the table. This is the 100 pound, uh, excuse me, 100 mile per hour wind speed that we've been talking about. These tables go up to 130, and we didn't go beyond that because in North Carolina it's typically, oh, here we do. Uh, the next page goes 140, 150, and 170. Down at the bottom here, we have an adjustment factor. <coughs> for building height and exposure. So let's zoom in on that. Um, and we need to talk about what exposure means. And then, of course, uh, mean height of the roof above the floor, above the ground plane is crucial. So these adjustment factors are amplifiers that account for exposure or height. And in a way, height is exposure because near the ground, you know that we always say, throw yourself down on the ground to get out of the wind. That's because the ground represents friction that's slowing down the air. And if you can make yourself thin enough and get down against the ground enough, you basically almost get out of the wind. But if you're 60 feet up in the air, you feel the full power of the wind. And as a consequence, you need to account for that height effect. <coughs> so let's talk about exposures. Exposure A used to be large city centers. The theory being that you had buildings all around you that were, blo were blocking the wind. Somebody at some point said, you know, those buildings can be torn down. They can even be torn down in a pattern that causes the wind to be amplified near your building. So this is a really specious category. And so at some point, somebody got rid of category A. So here's the irony. You have exposures here of B, C, and D, and A has disappeared. And it would be nice if we renamed them A, B, and C. <coughs> But there are a lot of people that got used to what B, C, and D meant before, and renaming them would cause more confusion than necessary. So we just got rid of category A and subsumed it under category B. Category B is closely spaced obstructions the size of a single family house. So this is like fairly dense suburbia. Category C, which we are also applying those same loads in large city centers. So pretty much from the moment you enter the, uh, the, um, the city, uh, you're going to apply this suburban rule all the way through. Okay, open terrain with scattered obstructions less than 30 feet high, that's category C. And then there are flat unobstructed areas and water surfaces outside the hurricane regions. So that's what B, C, and D means. And by the way, if you ever are worried about what all these things mean, you can consult with your engineer or read the uh, codes more carefully. For our purposes, we're going to focus on B because that would be typical of what you would have to deal with in most of North Carolina, uh, certainly in Raleigh. Okay, so... We got a short building, 16 feet tall, flat roof. We're summarizing the wind loads that we found from the table. You'll recall that the overpressure on the windward wall was 15.9 pounds per square foot, and it was positive, indicating it's an overpressure. <coughs> the wind suction on the windward half of the roof was 19.1 pounds per square foot, so the minus indicates suction. Um, and the wind suction on the leeward side of the roof was minus 10.8. And just to make sure you remember where that comes from, in these tables, this was the 15.9 on the uh, overpressure on the windward wall, 
This is the 19.1 suction up on the windward half of the roof and the 10.8 suction on the leeward half of the roof. And for the little building we're talking about here, those are the only three loads we have to account for. So, um, this is an example of wind design pressure calculations. <coughs> In this case, we're assuming a building 60 feet tall with a flat roof and 100 mile per hour wind speed in exposure B. Oh, and I, I need to go back, by the way, and make the point. All these numbers in this table are for exposure B. If you have other exposures, you have to apply adjustment factors. So you'll notice B is an adjustment factor of one everywhere up to 30 feet. So for zone B up to 30 feet, you just take this table and you make no adjustments to it. If you're in zone B, though, and you go over 30 feet, you have to start making uh, altitude exposures or height exposures, height adjustments. And also you have to make adjustments for exposure. So zone C, C has an adjustment of 1.21. Zone D has an adjustment of 1.47, corresponding to a fairly low building. <coughs> okay, so we're going coming back to this example. We're going to say because the building is more than 30 feet high, the variation in pressure that occurs above 30 feet must be taken into account through the height and exposure adjustment factor. And we're going to say for, for simplicity, we're going to use the height and exposure adjustment factor for 60 feet for all elevations between 30 and 60 feet. So if I come back here, we're saying we have no adjustment factor up to there. And then instead of applying 1.05 and 1.09 and 1.12 for various bands, we're going to just jump up and grab this factor and say that's conservative and we're going to apply it everywhere in this region between 30 feet. So in other words, 35, 40, 50, 45, 50, 55, and 60. We're going to use this same factor of 1.22. <coughs> Again, we're on the conservative side, but we're trying to simplify our calculations. So we have an adjustment factor up to 30 feet of 1.00 because we're in zone B. Um, so we're going to say the pressure on the windward wall from 0 to 30 feet up is 1.0 times 15.9 pounds per square foot, which we got out of the table. Then for the adjustment factor at 60 feet, we have 1.22. So <coughs> We're saying to be conservative between a height of 30 feet and 60 feet, the design pressure on the windward wall is going to be this adjustment factor times the 15.9 pounds per square foot. Or in other words, in that zone, we're going to assume 19.4 pounds per square foot. Uh, on the roof, we have that same adjustment factor of 1.22. We had a suction out of the table of 19.1 pounds per square foot, so on the windward side of the roof. So we apply our adjustment factor of 1.22 and we get a wind suction on that portion of the roof of 23.3 pounds per square foot. On the leeward side, half of the roof, we have the same 60 foot uh, height adjustment factor but we had a suction of 10.8 pounds per square foot for the lower levels. So when we apply this 1.22 adjustment factor, we get a wind suction of 13.2 pounds per square foot. So that looks something like this. Uh, we got the 15.9 down here. The 1.22 adjustment factor kicks that up to 19.4 for the second 30 feet. And you notice that the effect is not that great if we'd drawn a line between there and there and accounted for all of that. It wouldn't have made much difference in our analysis. So jumping to this 19.4 over this entire zone made good sense. <coughs>
likewise, we have a suction up here of 23.3 pounds per square foot. It would have been 19.1 down here, but we have a factor of 1.22 by which this has been amplified. And then over here, down at this level, if we'd had the roof there, it would have been 10.8, but now it's 13.2. Uh, pounds per square foot of suction on that part of the roof. And again, I emphasize there would be wind load over here that would be taken away from this, but by the nature of the way the tables were made out, all this load got combined with this. And they're basically saying, from a point of view of analyzing the overall wind frame, uh, the overall wind resisting structural system, that this is a very accurate way to do things. <coughs> One last little topic. In addition to the main wind force resisting structural system, which we just talked about, we also have to account for forces on components. The wind, wind suction on corners related to uh, cladding of the building uh, are, are sometimes quite a bit higher and uh, we're not going to go into this in any detail excuse me but I will say that um, in the sizing or, or determining the strength of windows for example and opaque cladding understanding how the wind forces occur in a very localized way becomes fairly crucial since this is a course in structures though we're going to focus our attention on the main wind force resisting system but you want to be aware that these pressures right here do not apply when we come to cladding these only apply to the main wind force resisting system and you know that has to be true because we're ignoring any wind suction on this face in terms of sizing the the main wind force resisting system but you know that those forces are there in terms of their effect on cladding and windows and you need to make sure that the cladding doesn't get ripped off the building or the windows torn off the building and then it's no longer an enclosed building you can end up with huge overpressure internal to the building so that's when it becomes crucial that you um, deal with these highly localized uh, pressure distributions Okay, so that concludes our discussion of static wind loads on buildings.